innocent victims of the sharp cutting edge of the enemy's military action have learned they can turn to us for help, support, and security. And to the American serviceman, it is equally clear that the battles won with the sharp edge of our own blade are only a beginning. Ultimate victory in Vietnam will be won through the people. In the civic action that complements the military action through our determined and skillful use of the full blade. The concept of the full blade became a reality during the rice harvest along the Cambien River. A small number of village farmers had asked for help. They knew that in a few nights, the Viet Cong would come to take what they needed in the form of a rice tax. So the men of the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, moved inland on an operation called Golden Fleece, a classic example of civic action. On the surface, it might have appeared that this was just another grinding, methodical patrol. But in the coming days, the men of the 9th Regiment would not only save a rice crop, they would challenge more than a decade of communist control with America's first broad employment of the civic action concept in the Far East. Song Cambien, a rich, fertile, and very carefully cultivated valley. There is a proverb here that says, every inch of earth is an inch of gold. It's nearly impossible to comprehend what years of Viet Cong terror and exploitation can do to a Vietnamese village. One certain side effect is suspicion. Any man who stands in a village street with a rifle over his arm is a man to be feared. But fortunately for the farming people of Song Cambien, there were others who weren't afraid. They told what they knew about the Viet Cong hiding places, talked about the enemy's leaders. The cutting edge would come first. Using village guides, Marine patrols would push the Viet Cong out of the valley complex. Then villagers in the area would be brought to a collection point, provided protection in their rice fields during the harvest. This would strengthen the people's desire to help themselves, a basic ingredient in the formula of security, ambition, and self-respect that is the hallmark of the full blade of civic action. As the first combat patrol swept southward through the tributaries of Song Cambien, a theory long held as gospel by the communist capital at Hanoi began to come apart at the scene. The Americans might fight in the Vietnamese countryside, but any real attempts at a genuine revolution in health, welfare, and self-sufficiency would be directed strictly toward the struggling central government in Saigon. This was the American way of doing things in the Far East. It was this postulate that the men of the 9th Regiment and their village guides began to pull apart during the first moments of contact with a Viet Cong stronghold. History hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. This is the benign face of terror in South Vietnam. To the farmers and peasants, 
he is a warrior of the seven-headed dragons. He operates best in a small group close to where he was born and raised. In these natural surroundings, he has identified with and helped to destroy all local governments of the immediate countryside. He has killed or threatened to kill all who would speak on behalf of the government in Saigon. He can hardly be expected to know the meaning of the words self-help, self-respect, and self-realization. 27 of his kind and their stolen weapons of war were captured by Marines during the first day of military operations near Song Cambien. But even then, there were areas of doubt. One of the Viet Cong's special talents is the ability to blend into a crowd of innocent men. With their initial military objectives secured, the Marines prepared to implement the full blade. If it could liberate the hearts and minds of the people of Song Cambien from old Viet Cong influences, if it could work in this small corner of villages, this second face of war might one day spread over all of South Vietnam. Now it was first things first. Using our immense resources of men, machines, and medical know-how to care for those who were in urgent need of immediate help. And assistance the enemy had neither the capacity nor the desire to extend. more to do. Their deeds in the coming days would demonstrate to the Vietnamese, in fact, that the democracy we take for granted is more than idle political theory. For a people whose very existence depends on the crops they cultivate, the most effective sort of civic action had to be in the fields and rice paddies, where the golden fleece was ready for harvest. This wasn't the time to challenge their ancient methods, to marvel at the crude machinery that has served their hands for hundreds of years. The story of the harvesters and reapers, tools of our 20th century, would come later. The important job was to bring in the crop to safety, away from the still very real threat of Viet Cong attack and direct gangland-style collection of rice tax, a tax that in the past has amounted to as much as 75% of the crop. To bring in the golden fleece of the native harvest, the same amphibious tractors that had carried the American servicemen into military action were used now to implement this phase of the civic action. The people too had to be brought in from the fields to the collection point. Here, they were given a safe haven, while the diplomats in dungarees brought to a conclusion a people-to-people -people program that began 10,000 miles away in the homes, churches, and businesses of the United States. They carried out a program which did more than words to dispel the distrust born of years of unfriendly propaganda.
still were some doubting Thomases. But in Vietnam, as everywhere else, there is still one sure route to the heart of a man. of course, there is no understanding of such words as people to people and political ideologies, but the babies unfold to warmth and kindness and food, and with the responsiveness of all children, their bigger brothers soon decide the people to people concept should work both ways. Nearby, the rice was being stored away with American servicemen and Vietnamese people, young and old, working side by side in the sort of cooperative effort that is doing the most to put forward our mission in Vietnam. To the Vietnamese, every bit of the crop is vital. The straw of the rice stalks is transformed into the mats on which they sit, the ropes that tie their bundles, the sandals on their feet, even the roots over their heads. And every single grain of rice is cherished. Soldiers of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam and American officers worked side by side in Operation Golden Fleece. With the grain stored, and the needs of the flesh attended to, it was time for another phase of our civic action. The story translated into pictures of the kind of help our technological advances can provide during future harvests along the Cambien River. The same Amtrak that carried out the fighting men and brought in the grain became a crude but effective motion picture theater. To the men who handed out the pamphlets that amplified the story told by the film, it was clear that the villagers were interested, and our positive action was wiping away the generation's old veneer of distrust and doubt. But whatever the method, whenever the harvest, the rice crop represents life itself to these people of Vietnam. Certainly, no Jason ever found a more truly golden fleece. Operation Golden Fleece was a classic example of combined military and civic action. Its fulfilled aim was to supplement the capabilities, needs, and aspirations of a people so that one day when we are gone, they will be able to carry on alone. one day confront the small boat navy. 
All along the 1,500 miles of South Vietnam's coastline and in the endless waterways of the Mekong River Delta, nine million acres of fertile wet rice paddies and farmlands. The only practical means of transportation for farmer and businessman, fishermen and tourist, government loyalist and Viet Cong is by water. Uncontrolled, this normal activity provides the VC with a continuing opportunity for smuggling and infiltration. It is clear to American naval observers early in the war that an essential step in denying this most populous area of South Vietnam to the Viet Cong would be the development of patrol craft suited to the task of controlling these lanes of transportation and communication. Some existing craft come close to fitting the requirements. The U.S. Navy's LCPL, originally designed for amphibious operations, is quickly singled out for assignment in Vietnam. The WPB, an 82-foot Coast Guard cutter used throughout U.S. waters, is one of the first craft to arrive for duty. Today, the Coast Guard and Navy work hand-in-hand -hand on coastal patrol. More advanced designs are studied. An air-cushioned vehicle capable of 60 miles per hour over ground or water is tested to examine the possibilities it offers for use in swampy terrain. In a search for shallow draft, high-speed craft, the Navy examines various hulls and propulsion systems, many of them already being used at the time in some of the newest pleasure boats and in small commercial craft, such as this high-speed supply and replenishment boat being used with offshore oil well rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. From this civilian hull is developed a new military craft, the U.S. Navy's patrol craft FAST, better known as the Swift Boat. 50 feet long and capable of running at 25 knots, the Swift Boat is armed with twin 50 caliber machine guns forward and a single 50 mounted with an 81 millimeter mortar aft. The Swifts are the first of the new Navy small boats to operate in Vietnam. There are two basic areas of operation for the small boat Navy in Vietnam, in the rivers and along the coast. The Swift boats were assigned to Operation Market Time, the Navy's code name for coastal patrol and security. Each day along the coast of Vietnam, thousands of civilian craft take to the waters in normal activities of fishing, travel, and marketing. To prevent the enemy from mixing with this normal traffic for smuggling and infiltration, the units of Operation Market Time are constantly on patrol. Operation Market Time is a continuous round-the-clock effort which is coordinated through five coastal surveillance centers located at key points along the coast. At each center, U.S. naval personnel work together with the South Vietnamese Navy to direct the activities of the units assigned to their surveillance area. And you only have Red Baron 3-2, proceed to intercept at that jump. Aye, uh, sir. Red Baron 3-2, this is Coast Watcher. Over. A suspicious contact report received at the Coastal Surveillance Center is relayed to a swift boat patrolling on station. Coast Watcher, this is Red Baron 3-2. Roger, over. 3-2, this is Coast Watcher. A small cargo junk has just departed the beach. This contact is unidentified. Proceed to intercept, over. Coast Watcher, this is Red Baron uh, 3-2. Uh, Roger, break. Uh, we'll intercept, over. Uh, set general quarters, prepare to board and search. The Swift boards hundreds of junks each day, searching for possible Viet Cong contraband, separating it from legitimate cargo. Because papers may have been falsified, holes are opened and inspected. Identification cards and cargo manifests have to be checked. If contraband is found, or if their papers are not in order, the men will be turned over to Vietnamese authorities. But the majority of people who encounter the American Swift boats are legitimate fishermen or merchants. And an important byproduct of Operation Market Time is the goodwill exchange between the American sailors and those who are operating within established regulations. 
swift boats have also assisted in many special operations the eighty one millimeter mortar gives the swift the capability to support friendly troop operations or defend vietnamese outposts along the coast in a firefight the swift fifty caliber machine guns have been used to support reconnaissance team amphibious assault and cover the evacuation of wounded from combat areas coastal patrols comprise the largest phase of operation market time but there is another phase operation stable door in which the u.s navy has formed a protective screen around the merchant ships which must wait in Vietnam's harbors until cleared to unload their vital cargo. On a hill overlooking the merchant ships is the harbor entrance control post in which a 24-hour surveillance is maintained over all movement in the Anchorage area. Listener, 3-3, three, three, this is high post, over. The other half of this harbor defense team is a detachment of U.S. Navy gunboats which patrol among the merchant ships themselves. Listener, 3-3, three, three, this is high post. High post, this is listener 33, over. High post. Eagle Watch, recon, reports, large fishing junk entering your area. Eagle Watch suspects he is changing course to avoid your patrol. Can you investigate? Over. High post, this is listener 33, roger. Have contact visually, we'll intercept, out. The stable door patrol boats move among the anchored merchantmen guarding from any possibility of Viet Cong attack or sabotage which could come in the form of underwater swimmers, mines, or small boats. They are especially wary of civilian craft that enter the immediate Anchorage area or move in an unusual manner. Suspicious junks are stopped and searched, cargoes are inspected, and identification papers are checked. Stable door patrol boats also work with divers of specially trained EOD or explosive ordnance disposal teams who are skilled in the detection and disposal of mines which could be planted by Viet Cong swimmers. By constantly checking the hulls of anchored merchant ships, these EOD divers have contributed heavily to the success of Operation Stable Door. Less than a mile from the anchorage on a hillside near Vung Tau is an illustration of a different phase of small boat Navy operations in Vietnam. In addition to their strictly military duties, the men of Operation Market Time contribute to many programs of civic action. In this case, helping an army nurse who has almost single-handedly adopted an orphanage. Throughout Vietnam, the Navy, along with other services and agencies, is committed to people-to-people -to -people programs like this one. These men go beyond their normal routine to do this work, and yet it may well be that in the long run, these extra voluntary efforts in civic action will prove to have been just as important as their regular military duties on coastal patrol. From the harbor here at Vung Tau to the inland port of Saigon, it is 45 tortuous miles of a twisting, turning river called the Long Tau. What makes it hazardous is that the Long Tau winds through a 400 square mile area of mangrove swamps and waterways known as the Rung Sat, the evil place. From the air, it looks drab, forbidding, uninhabited. But to the Viet Cong, it represents a continuing opportunity to sink one of those merchant ships, to block the shipping channel, and stop the flow of supplies to Saigon. Here on duty in the Long Tau is another detachment of the small boat navy. Take him in. Take him forward. All clear. Hold ahead one. Each morning, just after the first light of dawn, the MSBs, U.S. Navy mine sweeping boats, cast off and begin to sweep the river. Right, sir, one one. All ahead twelve. Five charge. The MSB is 57 feet long wooden hulls and charged with the single vital responsibility of keeping the river free of mines. To do this, the crewmen deploy special minesweeping gear. It is designed so that when the sweep has been set to drag behind the boat, 
special blades attached to the cable will cut any control wires or mooring devices attached to the mine. Once the gear is out, the six-man crew settles into what has become a familiar team. Long hours of methodically moving up and down the long tow, periodically resetting the sweep gear, standing guard, and more hours of sweeping. This, too, has become part of the daily routine. Somehow, no one remembers exactly how, these men have established their own small people-to-people -people program. It's not much. Cigarettes, soap, a few items of food left over from their daily ration. But every day, as the minesweeper passes this small settlement on the riverbank, the welcoming committee is ready. And in a way, the hand of friendship is extended. Day after day, from dawn until dusk, the MSB sweep the long town. And yet, it is never really routine. Often passing only a few yards from the riverbank, the MSBs are vulnerable and have often been hit by VC snipers and recoilless rifle fire. On October 9, 1967, the minesweepers of Detachment Alpha, Mine Squadron 11, were awarded the first presidential unit citation of the Vietnam War for extraordinary heroism in action. The Navy's code name for patrol and security operations on the rivers of Vietnam is Operation Game Warden. The minesweepers are one part of this effort, but they are by no means alone. At the end of the day, the minesweepers returning to their base near Na Bae pass by a pier where another branch of small boat Navy is preparing to send out its night force. Also based at Nabe are units of one of the Navy's newest craft, the River Patrol Boat, or PBR. The PBR developed from an existing civilian pleasure craft has been redesigned and equipped for use in Operation Game Warden on the rivers of Vietnam. I'll be patrol officer Stingray 1, cover boat will be Stingray 1-7. We have friendly ambushes located tonight, here, and here. These are the men who ride the PBR. Their mission is to conduct continuous patrols day and night, denying the use of the waterways to the Viet Cong for the transport of men, supplies, or communication. 2300, in the dark of the moon, and the crossing attempts tonight will probably occur sometime between 2300 and 0300. I want one boat positioned in here all the time. The other boat will patrol through the complete area. Each boat carries a four-man crew, consisting of the boat captain and helmsman, a forward machine gunner manning twin 50s, and an aft gunner manning a single 50 with an M79 grenade launcher. The PBR is a high-speed fiberglass boat, drawing only 18 inches of water no propellers or other hull protrusion. It is powered at speeds up to 25 knots by water jet pumps, which not only drive the boat, but also steer it. Here in the Rung Sat, the primary mission is to keep the shipping channel secure. To the PBR, this means constant patrol, checking out any suspicious craft or unusual activity along the shore. By denying the VC the ability to move freely in this area, Operation Game Warden has kept open the vital shipping route into Saigon. In addition to their important contribution to the security of the Rung Sat, BBRs operate at several other locations in the Delta. At Bin Tui, near Canto, on the Basak River, the headquarters for the River Patrol Force. From this command center, the activities of Operation Game Warden units throughout the Delta are coordinated. Almost everything that moves any distance in the Delta moves by water. These men, from intelligence reports and first-hand observation, keep up to date on where the VC are and what they're doing. We don't have any support in there other than the sea wolves. Uh, we can get them for you in about six, seven minutes. Uh, make sure you've got your ammo checked out for chow. Make sure you've got all your charts up to date. The critical importance of controlling the rivers and canals is what has brought the small boat navy to the Delta. 
Their job is to secure the waterways for those who are engaged in legitimate business and travel and to deny them to the Viet Cong. Like their shipmates in the coastal waters, the men of Operation Game Warden spend much of their time boarding and searching the thousands of civilian craft which crowd the inland waterway. Representatives of the Vietnamese National Police assigned to duty with the PBRs advise their American counterparts, check documents, and interpret the objectives of Operation Game Warden to the Vietnamese people. Nine times out of ten, they're simply on their way to market or returning home. As a gesture of friendship, soap or cigarettes may be given to the people or a printed explanation of how Operation Game Warden hopes to protect and benefit them. Then the PBRs resume their routine patrol. Nine times out of ten. But then, then there's the tenth time. X-ray of one. This is Warden X-ray. I have Sampan crossing up ahead. Uh, break. I will uh, attempt to intercept. Take off. Warning shots fired in the air are the signal for a suspicious craft to stop and identify itself. Uh, Warden X-ray one. This is uh, Warden X-ray. Uh, seems to be heading uh, to the beach. Take area under fire. Uh, try for maximum results. Over. A junk or sampan that turns to run from a PBR has something to hide. And in BC territory, the PBRs don't take any chances. Uh, Warden 1, uh, Warden X-Ray, over. This is Warden 1, Roger, over. Warden 1, this is Warden X-Ray, uh, 1 sampan. This is Warden 1, Roger that. Return fire from the riverbank indicates a larger force supporting the crossing. What looks at first like a couple of farmers or fishermen may turn out to be VC, carrying intelligence, supplies, weapons, or the sampan loaded with explosives. Warden X-ray receiving heavy automatic weapons fire vicinity of evasion. Uh, request a scramble sea wolves. Over. This is Warden One. Roger. Uh, steel base three. Steel base three. This is Warden Warden. Scramble sea wolves. At the River Patrol Force headquarters, the request for air support is relayed to an LST downriver which serves as one of the several bases for special Navy helicopters supporting the PBRs. These are the Sea Wolves, armed helicopter gunships operated by Navy pilots from LSTs and airstrips throughout the Delta. They stand by on call to provide reconnaissance or fire support for the PBR. Armed with machine guns and air-to-surface rockets, the Sea Wolves are prepared to move quickly to the scene of action. Working together, the PBR Sea Wolf team can deliver that extra measure of firepower which gives the edge to the small boat navy. With nightfall, the Delta undergoes a subtle change, for the night presents a special challenge. The Viet Cong take advantage of the hours of darkness to activate their lines of communication. For the PBR crews preparing for night patrol, there is the knowledge that now is when they are most likely to encounter the VC. Again, they move out to their stations in pairs. Through the long, warm night, they maintain their vigil, either moving quietly along the river or lurking, silent and invisible, at the location of some suspected VC crossing point. Night patrols by the units of Operation Game Warden have sharply limited the mobility of the Viet Cong guerrillas in an area where they once moved almost at will. On many nights back in the dock at Bintui, at about the time the PBR night patrols are arriving on station, 
A small band of men working silently behind the scenes is preparing to move to an undisclosed location downriver. To them, the darkness of the Delta night is an ally and a friend. These are the Navy SEAL team, so-called because they operate on sea, air, and land. The SEALs operate in hostile and restricted environments with almost no support. The intelligence they bring back is often the basis for key operations of the small boat Navy. One of the bonuses provided by the introduction of the PBRs in the Delta has been the opportunity for expanded programs for civic action. By getting to know the people in the towns and villages throughout their patrol areas, the men of the small boat Navy have become familiar with their needs and have found ways to help them. Usually, it is the basic things which are important. In this case, cement and steel reinforcing rods, which will allow the villagers to complete work on a small bridge they have been building. Medcap, medical civic action patrols are also run as regularly as possible. American and Vietnamese doctors and corpsmen hold clinics in villages which would otherwise go for months without medical treatment. This kind of attention from friendly forces is often the winning stroke against the Viet Cong. Operation Game Warden has done much to limit Viet Cong movement in the Mekong Delta. More recently, a new branch of the small boat Navy has helped to take the fight beyond the river into VC sanctuaries in the swamps and rice paddies. For many years, the South Vietnamese Army and Navy have worked together in river assault groups attacking Viet Cong concentrations throughout the Delta. To augment this effort and increase the pressure on the VC, American SALT troops are stationed on, moved and supported by ships and craft of the United States Navy. They operate in ever-increasing numbers throughout the 4,500 miles of rivers and canals in the Delta area. This is River Flotilla One, an American fighting force designed for riverine warfare, with barracks and support ships which serve as mobile bases, capable of moving quickly from place to place in the Delta. The Navy craft assigned to accomplish this job have been adapted specifically for operation in the rivers and canals of Vietnam. The ATC, armored troop carrier, which transports the assault troops. The CCB, command communications boat, or floating command post. And the LCM monitor, battleship of the fleet, which provides firepower to protect the force and support the landing. In effect, River Flotilla One is the amphibious assault group of the small boat Navy. The assault craft moved the troops from the afloat base to the scene of the operation, often several miles away. In a typical search and destroy operation, as the force approaches their objective, they move from the main river channels into narrower streams. The landing areas are softened up with fire. shore and the troops are landed. The operation may last two days or as long as a week. While the troops are ashore, some assault craft are assigned to form a blocking force and provide gunfire support if needed. Others return to the base to stand by. When the operation is over, Troops are picked up and returned to the mother ships. Later, the entire flotilla will move to the scene of the next operation. In a sense, the modern United States Navy, attuned to the advanced technologies of the space age, has had to adjust to the unique nature of the conflict in Vietnam. The demands of coastal patrol and river warfare have produced new craft and new tactics to meet the situation. Vietnam has given birth to a new breed of sailors. 
Unprepared at first, he has developed the craft and weapons to do the job. Unskilled, he has studied and learned the ways of the river. Trained to military accomplishment, he has achieved many of his greatest successes through civic action. He sails not upon the seas and oceans of the world, but on the local waters of a small country in Southeast Asia. He is a member of a proud new rank of men who have taken a step beyond convention to accept a unique new challenge in Vietnam, a challenge which has been met by the small boat navy.